Hello everybody, Greg is here. Today I want to show some new publications and share some ideas. But to start, I uh, decided to show this quote from uh, a famous theoretical chemist, Nastasia Alexandrova from University of uh, California in Los Angeles, in an interview which uh, she gave here in relation to this uh, interesting review published in Chemical Engineering News. She says the following phrase, every model of chemical bonding is wrong. The basic thing in chemistry, chemical bond, one would think, well, that's something we really understand well, but we actually don't. And I want to warn you here, this uh, video will have some speculations, maybe some things you would, may disagree with. If this is the case, please let me know in the comments. So what do, or maybe what don't we know about the chemical bond formation? And that's the classic energy in versus distance chart. So imagine each yellow ball here is a hydrogen atom. Each hydrogen atom has one electron. And initially you have two atoms which are separated. Okay, and they don't feel each other, they don't know about each other. In such a state, each electron on each separate atom exists in a superposition of uh, spin plus half and minus half. I put an arrow up here while minus half is actually arrow down, but uh, just to show that both of those atoms are identical. When they collide, and that not every collision results in a chemical bond, but let's say this particular one we discussed results in a chemical bond. Two events are happening. First, the spins interact between themselves and they become of opposite spins. It's sort of quantum entanglement. So one of them becomes plus half and the other minus half. We don't know which of them which, but if you measure one and it's plus half, the second will be minus half. The second thing that happens is that two atomic orbitals become one molecular orbital. That's so-called hybridization of orbitals. And it's of course not necessarily in this order. And actually when you study chemistry, you don't think those are separate processes. You always that's at least what I thought. It's, it's one process when everything happens at once. Both of those events happens at once. Do they really need to happen at once? But that's theoretical questions. The practical question, can we actually stop those two atoms at some distance between them and check what happens there? Is one of those processes happens before the other? And this is what we're going to discuss in more detail in the next slides. So how do we stop two atoms at a distance so they would interact but not make a bond between them? So this is the first example I will show today from the recent paper. Yes, I showed this work in a couple of previous videos already, but that's why it's so important and that's why it's so cool. This is a cube made of germanium atoms in which two of them have an unpaired electron. And despite there is no chemical bond between them, the spins here are opposite. This is a singlet. When the spins are opposite, it's a singlet. When they're parallel, it's a triplet. Professor Franking did a calculation of this electronic structure and he confirmed that indeed there is no chemical bond, but there is an interaction. And due to this interaction, this is a singlet ground state. The energetical difference between singlet and triplet is 18.2 kilocalories per mole. But you can say, well, maybe that's something to do with the germanium. Germanium is not a very usual atom. Who knows, maybe with other atoms it wouldn't work. However, the parent system made of carbons, which is actually C8H6, was studied in the 90s by Professor Joseph Michel, and it was a very similar situation. The singlet was by 10 kilocalories per mole more stable than the triplet, and again there was no bond between those carbons. The answer for these questions in the paper title, can the bond be introduced, is no. That he clearly answered this in the paper. But you can say, well, this is a special situation. Both of those germaniums or those two carbons are in the same molecule. Yes, there is one, two, three bonds between them. But still, maybe that's some uh, flow in those bonds happening. So the question here, can such interactions be observed between two separate molecules? And believe it or not, the answer is yes. And that's another work I showed before about two 
radicals which look like Olympic rings, which form dimers bounded by pi pi interactions. And despite the very long distance between those radicals, 3.3 angstrom, while the single bond is 1.5, the ground state of this dimer is a singlet. It's more stable than triplet by 3.28 kilocalories. And this is not a single example. In a more recent publication from a group of Professor Wang, a radical pair was reported in which the radicals are not identical. That's even more interesting. And they held not only by pi pi interaction, but also by electrostatic because they have opposite charges. This is the X-ray structure. The distance between the radical here is even longer than in this one. However, the singlet triplet gap is also close to zero. I think triplet is slightly lower in energy, but it's almost zero. So definitely an interaction happens also here. And that proves the point. If we bring two molecules with unpaired electron close enough, the electrons will interact without making a bond and they will interact in the way that the spin inversion happens without any hybridization. Their only problem with those two publications, it's not a problem, it's a feature, uh, but um, something that limits the theory a little bit is that the electron here and here is not localized on a single atom. It's delocalized over the whole aromatic system. So one can say, well, because of the delocalization, this interaction happens. And if we make an electron more local, something else will happen. So can intermolecular interaction like that with spin inversion be observed without the delocalization and the pi pi stacking? Can we make two radicals with localized electrons to form a complex? The idea of how this can be done comes from the group of Professor Schreiner. So he studied the coupling of radicals with aerial substituents. And he saw that actually before this bond forms, there is an attraction by London forces, or London dispersion, which is a sort of van der Waals bond between those bulky substituents. So those radicals are not exactly a good model to study radicals at the distance because they do not stop at the distance. The bond always forms here. And also because those groups here are aromatic, so electron delocalizes on them as well. However, we can use the same idea We're using the London dispersion, dispersion to make a complex of two radicals without aromatic substituents. So which substituents should we use? Potential answer coming from the same group of Professor Schreiner. In a recent publication, he showed that silyl groups are very strong dispersion energy donors. It is a very elegant publication. He studied the energy differences between those two isomers and he saw that the interaction between silyl groups really keeps this isomer more stable in certain cases. And the energy was measured and calculated. So bottom line is that such substituents are usually considered to be neutral, that don't making bonds between them whatsoever, like 3-methylsilyl or tertiary butyl dimethylsilyl. They can be attracted to each other and make the complex we're looking for. But guess what? We studied radicals with such substituents before, and I showed this work in the previous videos, but now I'll show it from a little bit different angle. So in this work, we generated silyl radicals. In this case, it's silyl radical with a three methyl silyl substituent, and here the radical with terch butyl dimethyl silyl substituent. So the radicals were generated and their decay was studied using electron paramagnetic resonance. And in both cases, for both radicals, there was second order decay. That means that per reaction event, two radicals disappear at once. So in the upper case where substituents are small, this bond forms and we isolated this dimer pretty straightforward. However, here, where the terch butyls are actually facing each other, there was no dimer in any spectroscopy. The only product we saw was a product of hydrogen abstraction. But if there is a product of hydrogen abstraction, there should be a first order decay because when hydrogen is abstracted, only one molecule disappears, not two. And we checked it several times on different models with this radical. There was always second order and never dimer. So I don't know what happens here. We published without discussing this unusual 
result. But now I think it can be actually a singlet radical pair complex. If one of the radicals change the spin upon interaction with another, it's like a dimer without a bond. And that will result in the second order decay in the spectroscopy. Only after that, they react to abstract the hydrogen from the hydrogen source. And how such a complex can look like? Regardless of if this is a real complex or not, it's an interesting theoretical question. So one idea is coming from the structure of the cube. Look at this cube a little closer. It actually can be imagined as two separate radicals face back to back. If you make a generalization, there is two options. So one is coming from this cube, right? Back to back. And one is the regular one with face to face, but without the bond. So it's too long to make a bond. While in both cases, the radicals in the dimer held by the London dispersion forces. So I'm not sure which one of those is more possible than the other, but at least this is something we can study by theoretical calculations. And if you have additional ideas, how the radicals can be held in the singlet dimer, please let me know in the comments. This brings me back to the slide I started with, uh, because we only spoke about the first sentence. But there's a second sentence here, it says that some bonding models can be useful. And how this model can be useful? To answer, I will first show some new results in the chemistry of frustrated radical pairs, which were published in the last few months. So there is a paper that was published this summer in Nature about the reaction of a radical pair. And the reason it was in Nature, because it was shown to activate carbon-hydrogen bond. That's as I already said in previous videos, one of the most important reactions in organic chemistry. Not only that, it's very regiospecific, but I will not go into the details here. Immediately after this paper was published in Nature, the same author made a perspective or a review article in JAX about several reactions of such frustrated radicals, which in his opinion, and also in my opinion, uh, very important and uh, shows what's the potential of all that. But I think there is even more potential here. If you use the model which I proposed in uh, this video, in the reactions that uh, Professor Song Ling showed, the general reaction scheme look like this. Each radical reacts separately. First one, you have intermediate product, then the second one, and you have the final product. However, if you take a singlet deradical complex, one can imagine that it can react in a concerted way. And then you will save a lot of energy because the two radicals will react with the molecule at once without any intermediate products and without this step. What I propose is to start from theoretical calculations to see what's the triplet singlet gap in such complexes. I'm really curious to see what would be the results. Okay, I hope this video was interesting and if it was, please subscribe, share it and of course like it. I think this is a very fundamental question that can lead to very interesting developments if I am correct and those stages are separate stages and maybe the chemical bond is just a special case of the fundamental interaction at the distance between two electrons. Thanks for your attention. Please do not forget to support Ukraine. Also support Israel, which experiencing very hard times as well right now. Have a good day.